It is literally an answer to prayer for Coloradans. There's finally a plan to allow visits inside senior care facilities. Colorado's best known anti-masker is suing the governor over the mask mandate. The head of the local postal workers union says machinery is not being dismantled in Colorado. That's about the only encouraging thing he has to say. A new daily news operation aims to bring a conservative voice back to Denver. And the cheesy theme song that we've loved for years gets a new remix for a city that could use some fresh encouragement. That's next. There is something happening tonight in Colorado and across the country right as we come on the air. Pro athletes across several sports are coming forward one by one and team by team to say that they will not play because America will not address the issue of police violence against black Americans. This is happening as we speak, so I can't tell you if the Rockies are going to take the field tonight or if the Nuggets are going to play tomorrow. This has the feeling of, of a dam breaking in progress, that America's professional athletes are now deciding that simply taking a knee or adding a slogan to the court has not properly captured the country's attention and sparked real change on this issue. The Rockies are reportedly meeting as a team to decide what to do. Rocky Matt Kemp posted that he can't play tonight, quote, knowing the hurt and anguish my people continue to feel. The Mariners, Padres, Giants, Dodgers, Brewers, and Reds are not playing in protest tonight. The NBA is not playing any games tonight after the Milwaukee Bucks and then other players announced that they wouldn't play. The Nuggets' Jamal Murray retweeted his support for NBA players beginning a boycott over the issue of social justice. Now, the Avs are going to play tonight. The NHL is having what it's calling a moment of reflection prior to the game. The impetus for today's player and team boycotts across sports, from baseball to the NBA to the WNBA, was the shooting of Jacob Blake in the back by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and then the shooting deaths overnight of two Black Lives Matter protesters after a call out for armed militias to confront those protesters in the streets. We'll keep you updated as we learn more about what's happening with our sports teams. So you have been asking for weeks, we have been asking for weeks, and finally there is now a draft plan to allow families in Colorado to go back inside nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Our Steve Steger looks at the conditions. Today I'm pleased to announce that we are releasing guidelines for indoor visitation for seniors, for nursing homes. Sarah Spaulding has waited six months to hear the governor say just that, watching as her parents struggle with isolation inside their assisted living facility. It gives us some hope that maybe soon uh, we'll be able to get into the facilities um, that families will yet again have a voice when it comes to the care of their loved ones. This doesn't mean that all of a sudden visits start like they did a year ago or six months ago. The draft guidelines would allow indoor visitations at facilities in counties with 25 or fewer cases per 100,000 residents. If the counties have between 25 and 175 per 100,000, any visitor would have to provide documentation that they've had a negative COVID test in the last 24 hours. I don't know who's going to be looking at those numbers on a frequent basis to be able to say, yes, today we're at under 25. Come on in. Spalding worries about that and the quick testing requirement. Who the heck is doing 24 turnaround on COVID tests? I can't get it right now through my employer unless I have symptoms. Many of the hospitals themselves uh, that have labs uh, are doing tests with that kind of turnaround. We are extremely optimistic in the future about building capacity around quick turnaround tests. Also in the guidelines, visitors will have to wear appropriate PPE, schedule appointments, and no one under the age of 18 will be allowed in. Having a plan um, at least will begin um, to, to start those conversations in care facilities if they haven't already. Now, these draft guidelines are open for the public's input through Friday. One of the suggestions Spalding is making is potentially adding a compassionate essential caregiver, a family member who can visit when needed to help with the care of a loved one. The governor expects to roll out the approved changes after all this input, hopefully this weekend, Kyle. We think of and acknowledge all the families that lost somebody before this day came. Steve, thank you. Colorado's loudest anti-masker, Republican House Minority Leader Patrick Neville, says he is closer now to the anti-mask lawsuit against the governor that he's been threatening for some time. 
Uh, Neville tweeted out in mid-July that he intended to sue the governor over his statewide mask mandate, said that it was an overreach. Fast forward to today, Representative Neville stood outside the state Supreme Court, accusing the governor of abusing his emergency powers and reiterating that he plans to sue the governor. He says he'll either file the lawsuit today or tomorrow. Give Neville credit. He knows how to turn a one-day story into a three-day story. The head of the Postal Workers Union in Colorado says he is fearful for the future of the agency. But he knocked down claims by prominent Democrats that mail equipment is being dismantled in our state. Our Mark Salinger is our mailman, looking at its effect on the election and beyond. When you open up your mailbox... Most of the time, you're not looking for your mail-in ballot. We deliver everything, uh, the veterans' medication, the retirees' Social Security check. So when we focus on the changes being proposed and implemented at the Postal Service, the conversation won't stop on Election Day. We're starting to see delays. We're starting to see mail pile up in the plant. Robert Helmick uh, is the president of the American Postal Workers Union in Colorado, representing about 500 Postal Service employees. He shared his perspective with us on where the Postal Service is at now and where he fears it could go. What keeps you up at night when it comes to this? That eventually we won't have a Postal Service. We've all seen reports of mail sorting machines being taken out of service across the country, but that hasn't happened here in Colorado. Robert says cuts in overtime for his employees are contributing to the delays. It affects the small communities more than it would affect the big city. The Postal Service denied our request for an interview, but sent us a statement. USPS says it is unaware of any large-scale delays in Colorado, but acknowledges that COVID-related employee availability has had some impact in some areas. The Postal Service also denies that overtime for employees has been reduced and says it has hired 1,900 employees in Colorado and Wyoming since the pandemic began. Robert sees a less rosy version of where the Postal Service stands. And that's what keeps me up at night, that we will wake up one day and the Postal Service, as we know, it will be no more. Important to note that the Postal Service and the Postal Service Union say that they have complete confidence that they can successfully deliver all the ma all mail ballots to voters in Colorado. Same thing always goes, though. If you don't mail it before a week out from Election Day, you got to go and drop it off in person at a ballot box. There are a ton of students who went back to school in Colorado this week, and the trick now is keeping them there for the full school year. I'm not talking solely about preventing COVID-19 related shutdowns. Colorado's school dropout rate is a concern in a normal year, and this is a year of added stress on students who might just decide they're going to walk away from classrooms or from remote learning. Which brings me to the opportunity that we have to help that situation through this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign as we together approach a half million dollars raised, five bucks at a time. The Word of Thanks that comes to mind when I think of Colorado Youth for a Change is re-enrollment. They are the re-enrollment specialists with years of experience helping students who have left school get back in school and get what they need to graduate. They got 400 plus kids back in to graduate just last year. And now this nonprofit is preparing for a challenge unlike any other this year, as we've already seen students just drop out and disappear from remote learning. So Colorado Youth for a Change has more than doubled its team of specialists. Dozens of people working with 17 school districts up and down the Front Range. They're in the metro area, they're north to Estes Park, and they're south to the Springs. They work with those schools to connect with those students and see what they need. We know it's a certainty. There are going to be students who vanish out of school this year, even ones that are close to graduation because you've got the challenges of the economy and the pandemic and remote learning. Colorado Youth for a Change has shown that they know how to get them back. They've been doing it for years, and we can help. If you're in for $5, as always, I will match the first $55 donations. If you text the word THANKS to 303-871-1491, I'll send you that link. You can also find it anywhere that you find next online. That nonprofit's team is ready to give Colorado students the one-on-one -on -one support that they need to overcome this year's unusual obstacles and to stay in school until they graduate. This has a big time cost savings for society in the long run if we can get them through graduation. We can support their work together this week and know that when students graduate next spring, we had a hand in that. A Colorado billionaire is bringing a conservative voice to daily news in Denver. He could restart the Rocky Mountain News, but is choosing not to. We'll look at why. And speaking of comebacks, 
Aurora's theme song from the 90s got a remix from an artist who wanted to bring some positivity back to her hometown. Next. Conservative billionaire and media man Phil Anschutz is finally launching a newspaper in Denver. The guy who bought the rights to the Rocky Mountain News years ago is instead expanding another of his brands to Denver, starting an online daily September 14th. I talked with Chris Reen, publisher of the Denver Gazette. Well, listen, I don't think that there's uh, any surprise that, uh, you know, we, we lean center right on, on our editorial pages. Uh, we're going to present a really well thought out um, arguments and strong arguments every single day. And we think the Denver market is looking for an alternative voice. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we think we're going to fill that void. Doesn't your boss still own the rights to the Rocky Mountain News name? Why not just relaunch the Rocky? People would get <laughs> jacked up about that. Why not do that? <laughs> that's a great question, you know, um, because here's why. We've invested an enormous amount in the Gazette brand, in our journalists, in our journalism. OK, so it makes sense for us as we're expanding to expand in that brand that we um, since 2012 have really put a lot of resources behind. It's been speculated that uh, that Anschutz would revive the Rocky or something similar to it for years now. Why now? We think that Denver is ripe um, for uh, additional local news. Uh, we, we see uh, we see local news being cut back in, in many ways. Um, and we're committed to producing high-quality journalism every single day. Would this be a venture you guys would even consider if the Denver Post was in a healthy state? Probably. You know, I mean, uh, listen, it's not just the Denver Post. It's, it's news in general. And, uh, and so we're focused, again, on, on producing that high-quality local news product, more local news than we think anyone else will produce on a daily basis. But the truth is, this is much more cost-effective for us to take a brand um, that we have already invested in and um, to utilize t technology and digital adoption and the rates that are changing uh, and, and, and really start a new product in Denver to where it's going, not where it's been. OK, and so that's, I think, what we're, we're focused on. Now, you know that this is where, where the way it's going with digital. Uh, it's the future. And uh, whether traditional media uh, companies uh, like ours will be there in three years or five years, we don't know. But again, we're going there right now. Did you have any discussion about printing a physical paper? Printing a, a physical newspaper is very expensive to do, as you know, uh, with production and presses and a distribution force. Uh, those, are, those are all legacy costs uh, that we don't think we need in a new venture like this. The Denver Gazette will go behind a $10 a month paywall before the start of next year. Between now and Election Day, it will be free to everybody and expected to continue the Colorado Springs Gazette's staunch advocacy for Republicans, including Senator Cory Gardner, and vocal opposition to his opponent, Democrat John Hickenlooper. You can see my full conversation with the publisher, Chris Reen, on the next YouTube channel. That sound you heard today after a record-tying high of 97 was rain, and there's more rain coming and cooler air. But we've got one more day with temperatures above average. Tonight, the showers are moving over the higher terrain. Too much rain in the Christine Lake Burn Scar area. They're watching for mudslides in the Glenwood Canyon area. A few showers with a little thunder and lightning over the metro area tonight between now and 8, and then we're done. Dries out. We've got a warm day tomorrow, a dry day with a 20% chance of storms again tomorrow afternoon. Little rain and thunder tonight. Oh, yes, it's great news. Lows in the mid-60s. Hot high of 96 tomorrow. And then a cool front brings low 80s Friday and a 70% chance of rain. Rain likely on Saturday and then temperatures in the 70s and 80s for the first few days of September. It just felt like a good way to kind of inject some positivity into our hometown that's seen a lot of heartbreak. A musician from Aurora puts her own spin on a classic. She's trying to remind people of the good in the place where she grew up. Next. Next viewers who go way back, like like four years back when we went, launched this program, you may remember our story on Aurora's gloriously cheesy theme song. One of those campy 1990s numbers that just overflowed with civic pride. Aurora, each day your beauty shines as brilliant as the dawn. Those tights. 
That ran on Aurora's cable channel in 1993. Last week, a musician who grew up in Aurora decided her city could use a new dose of positivity. Aurora is such a diverse suburb. It's, it's not really your typical suburb in terms of there's lots of different kinds of people. <laughs> My name is Neela Pekarik, and I'm a musician, um, and I grew up in Aurora. So I just did a cover version of a song called Positively Aurora. Aurora, in this great land we have a place we can grow strong. And it was this 1993 like public channel 8 theme song for Aurora that was written. And having grown up in Aurora at that time, I think it just resonates with all of us, you know, 30-somethings. I got the idea to make a music video, um, all with Aurora-grown folks as well. Aurora, each day your beauty shines as brilliant as the dawn. It's supposed to be earnest and over the top, um, like the original. The video comes from a place of just very, you know, a lot of joy, a lot of lightheartedness, and um, some people said, you know, as I posted it around, like, oh, this is a wonderful tribute to Aurora, and I love that take on it as well. My dreams too. People watch it and they're like, this is really strange. I like that take as well. I think it's, you know, with art you put it out and, and people take it as they will. Yeah, Aurora has seen a lot of heartbreak lately. I'm not trying to make light of um, all the horrible things that are happening, but more so just trying to um, bring some positivity. Positivity Aurora. I hope that if people watch the video, it just brings a little joy to their day. And me. That's great. Your $5 and mine are going to help some students in Colorado stick with school this year instead of dropping out of remote learning. Some are so close to graduating, and we know just the people to get them there. That and your feedback next. Colorado has an issue with school dropouts each year, and we know that the remote learning situation is not going to help that. We've told you about the students that have just kind of vanished from the system. Our Word of Thanks microgiving project this week supports Colorado Youth for a Change. It's a nonprofit that has long specialized in seeking out and supporting and getting those students back into class and seeing them through graduation. They have doubled their team, dozens of people that are working with 17 school districts up and down the front range. If you text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I will send you the link to donate. If you're good for five bucks, as always, I'll match the first 50 of those. And we've seen week after week, when we work together, this audience can do really big things. Almost half a million dollars raised for these nonprofits. Our feedback tonight comes from Glenn Colton on social justice protests by pro athletes. He writes, maybe white people should protest the NBA because there's no diversity. I can't, no, we're not gonna do that. 